Welcome to AI with AI, that's Artificial Intelligence with Andy Lachinsky, a podcast from CNA Talks where we discuss the latest breakthroughs and implications in artificial intelligence and autonomy. We have an email address, ai at cna.org. If you have any questions or comments, just drop us a line, ai at cna.org. And if you're listening to us on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, don't forget to check out our website where we will post all the links that we discussed today. That's cna.org forward slash C-A-A-I. Well, with that, Andy, what's the latest and greatest in artificial intelligence and autonomy? Well, we, we haven't had a COVID-19 story for a while, so let's start with that one. Uh, this is from the middle of last month, published at PLOS Digital Health. Mm-hmm. And it's not so much AI-centric as data-centric. So researchers from the School of Public Health in Boston, Massachusetts, they wrote a short piece where they kind of summarize their findings dating back a year and a half, you know, almost two years now. And by the way, they're a part of a group called Crisis Ready. Mm-hmm. So we'll provide the, the link. The idea for this particular group of researchers, they're really epidemiologists, and the idea is to help policymakers, right, understand um, and how to make insights, presumably from human mobility data. Mm-hmm. You, know, you and I have talked about a variety of stories in the last two years, you know, monitoring the impact of social distancing, travel restrictions, and so on. Mm-hmm. So what this link is about, and there's a link both to a short summary and a slightly longer paper, but there's like lots of details embedded within the paper. It's, as I say, it's a summary of what fundamentally is an argument for why this data for good, or what could be thought of as data for good, failed to really make a significant impact during COVID. Mm. And there are a variety of reasons. A lot of them overlap with what we've talked about more specifically in the domain of AI. For example, Mm -hmm. data sharing agreements between researchers and technology companies were very hastily arranged, and that kind of led to lots of issues. Things that you and I see kind of in the Navy world, right? Mm -hmm. Lack of standardization, interoperability issues, clarity or biases in various data sets. So um, it's a very nice, succinct view of a lot of lessons learned. And that's really what it's fundamentally for, not just for COVID, for a variety of other things, but in the context of COVID in particular. Hmm. I got to wonder, you know, given you mentioned the the things that we see just supporting the Navy and, you know, Department of Defense writ large, that lack of interoperability issues, lack of standardization on data reporting and requirements just within, you know, its own institution, that problem is going to be even more globally, obviously. So, I got to wonder, without anyone really driving this, mm-hmm. really, how is this going to get better other than pointing out something that is, just strikes me as a, as a longstanding problem? The broadest issue that underlies all of this is the pervasive belief that just because something exists here, data for good, and we have lots and lots of data, lots of lots of people that can make use of it, yeah. and presumably will, it doesn't mean it's going to work. I mean, it sounds <laughs> almost banal in its triviality, but that underscores a lot of problems. Absolutely. Two quick little news items that caught my eye. Uh, Again, back in January, January 18th, Mm -hmm. the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, it launched the Bipartisan Commission on AI. Uh, The Chamber of Commerce, as people probably know, is the largest lobbying group in the United States, represents, I don't know, a couple of million businesses and organizations. Mm -hmm. So former representatives John Delaney is a Democrat from Maryland and Mike Ferguson, Republican from New Jersey. They're going to co-chair the commission. And the idea is to convene a bunch of thought leaders uh, from government, industry, society at large. Mm -hmm. And the first meeting is going to be held in the beginning of March with a report due later in the year. And the idea in the charter is to recommend bipartisan AI policy options. The first main topic would be global competitiveness and regulations. Mm -hmm. One thing that caught my eye is just glancing over the members of the commission. There's something like, I don't know, nine or 10 of them. Only one Mm -hmm. has kind of an overt connection to AI, Alex Demakis. Um, He's a professor at Mm -hmm. UT Austin, and he's the co-director of the National AI Institute and the Foundations of Machine Learning. But looking over the list, Mm -hmm. that's the only one. That's fine, because the whole point is they're going to be soliciting input from a variety of stakeholders, including researchers, I presume. But it's just interesting that right. AI on an AI commission is only represented <laughs> to a fraction of about one, one, one of 10. Yeah. And I have to wonder, right, we talked previously about the European Commission putting forth its ideas and thoughts on how they want to be regulating and seeming to be ahead of the curve. We also talked about some Department of Commerce response to where the European Commission was. So you can definitely see this being in response to trying to get back on the path here of what the U.S. needs to be doing, particularly when it comes to regulating these technologies. So this another item from the beginning of February, 
<laughs> has a little bit of a clickbaity angle to it, but it's a genuinely mm -hmm. interesting reading, and it refers to robot dogs again, although this time not mm -hmm. from Boston Dynamics. So the news item is, um, and it's really just from a blog that, that caught my eye from the Department of Homeland Security, specifically their Science and Technology Directorate. They had a featured article blog, and it really is worth reading. It's, it's, it's kind of filled with interesting detail about how they're testing a robot dog, indeed. It's from a competitor mm -hmm. of Boston Dynamics called Ghost Robotics. And apparently it's been working, mm -hmm. or the company has been working with DHS for about two years or so. And so it's a bunch mm -hmm. of experiments designed eventually to use these robot dogs to uh, help with the patrolling the southern border. And the clickbaity mm -hmm. title, which is how I, I came to this, in Daily Star <laughs> in the UK. And the title of the story was mm -hmm. Terminator Dog Robots to be Deployed on U.S. Border as Black Mirror Comes to Life. And instead of telling us anything about it, they first incorrectly assert U.S. Border Protection has deployed robotic dogs. No, it hasn't. I mean, mm. it's, it's just testing these things. And then this, most of the story is yeah. about how Twitter users have, are reacting in horror, the metalhead, you know, Netflix, <laughs> Black Mirror, and so on. The real story is a lot more interesting, at least for those of, of our listeners who care about this sort of thing. Um, you'll learn about how they were trained somewhere not too far from where we are right now, Lork, Virginia. Then they were moved to El yeah. Paso, Texas, tested in a variety of realistic scenarios, as the blog calls it, including simulated sentry duty. One interesting aspect mm -hmm. of this, they referred to an autonomous mode setting where this robot dog, mm -hmm. it's about 100 pounds or so. It can carry like 20 pounds of, of payload and they can walk up hills and down ravines, over rocks. But mm -hmm. in autonomous mode setting, apparently it can be given predetermined GPS waypoints and there's not really, I, I mm -hmm. suspect, not too much AI smarts except you know, head to your waypoint, move somewhere else and you return whatever yeah. data your sensors record. That's kind of the extent of it. Mm -hmm. And there's no real word I, I don't see in my notes as to if they do plan on actually deploying these things on the border, which is certainly the plan. Um, I didn't get a timetable mm -hmm. on that, but um, the blog entry itself is just a few pages long, um, but it's actually filled with a, a lot more detail than one normally finds on these things. It's, it's a fun read. I'm just kind of curious what sensors ha it has on it. Clearly, these aren't Terminator dogs, right? right? They don't have guns or anything like that on them. But, you know, what kind of, uh, is it more than optical? Do they have, you know, 360? Can they actually be, quote unquote, looking behind them? I'm kind of mm -hmm. curious what they've uh, kitted these things out with. So to go relatively quickly, but I guess it's in line with this last story we gave. So there are lots of people that are concerned with the, this, uh, this Terminator-like uh, technology. So there is a survey that's been recently published about a month ago or so in the International Journal of Human-Computer Interaction, and specifically mm -hmm. from researchers in the University of Tokyo. And what it's about, I think it used something like a, a little over a thousand respondents. The idea was to probe how the public views AI and the various kind of use cases of AI mm -hmm. from the perspective of what they call eight themes. And by themes, they mean things like privacy, accountability, safety, security, mm -hmm. you know, promotion mm -hmm. of human values and so on. And to give an example of how they did this, they had four different scenarios. One is art where you can use AI generated singers, for example, or uh, to recreate, right? Like holographic versions of people who are no longer with us, which is in fact one of the scenarios. Mm -hmm. uh, a service scenario, customer service AI weapons, autonomous weapons, and crime. Crime prediction, yeah. Right. And you'd have the small little snippet the people that are part of the study would be faced with as an example. Just a short little paragraph, the first statement of which would be, I am a researcher, let's say, in the field of information science. Mm -hmm. Then there's going to be a beneficial aspect of my research, like I'm using mm -hmm. AI technology, I'll analyze the voice and behavior of a deceased singer, whatever, and this mm -hmm. is what I'm going to be doing. Then there's the possibly anxious aspect of, of this uh, research where, well, the technology is already in practical use, but people are concerned, you know, blah, 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 and you, you kind of voice your concerns. And then the dilemma mm -hmm. situation of what the respondents are supposed to now uh, give their thoughts on. May I continue mm. on with this research? Again, mm. so four scenarios, uh, art, service, weapon, and crime. And the idea was just to see how demographics correlate and backgrounds correlate with the various responses. There's far too much information here to go over, but a couple of the interesting things, uh, like with respect to the weapon scenario, <laughs> it turns out that older more than young and women more than men and in particular, those who understand AI, as opposed to those who have only a passing notion, all considered mm -hmm. 
that all of the themes, and remember there are eight separate themes from privacy, accountability, and so on, all of the themes for those uh, groups should be considered much more in this scenario. Mm -hmm. The group with low interest in science or technology, more than the group with high interest, was likely to consider that all the themes were fine, no, no problem. There are lots of other little snippets in here, which is kind of interesting. The researchers themselves say that they were very well aware that there were prior studies similar to these that have all shown that risk is perceived more negatively by women, by older mm -hmm. people, and those with more subject knowledge. So they were expected mm -hmm. to see something different. They really didn't, except for the thing that they say surprised them. Um, it didn't really surprise me, but it surprised the researchers, that many of the topics within AI require significant explanation. And this is <laughs> quoting from their paper, much more so than we realized. Mm. Also, the point of this particular survey is just people at large. These were not AI experts, and it would mm -hmm. be interesting to see how, how that would differ. But as, just as a cross-section mm. of how individuals view AI and whether we should really be concerned about how the research is going, it's, it's an interesting dissection of how different backgrounds and states of knowledge about AI, how they play into how people perceive what AI is being used for. Yeah, sort of echoes of Melanie Mitchell's easy things are hard, this idea that if you're not familiar with the technology and, and how it really works, your perception of what, what may be really hard may not be correct. And so you actually may have a not quite uh, aligned concern with what is actually what, what you should really be worried about. Right. But, um, you know, an another interesting data point, I was a little confused about this web diagram, though, because they said they measured things on a scale from one to seven. But the little web diagram only seems to go up to five, and none of the things seem to hit more than four. <laughs> yeah. um, so I'll yeah. need, to, need to check that out. Uh, I was I was surprised by the, the measurements actually didn't seem to have much variance given the actual scale. But Some more than others, but, but yeah, yeah, yeah. One, one, that, that's, a, that's a valid criticism. Yeah. Uh. We have a, a research item, but I'm not going to go into details here. There are really only two main points I want to make about it. So this is a preprint from researchers at Stanford University working with the Toyota Research Institute. And it very mm -hmm. much concerns the data mm -hmm. used for autonomous uh, vehicles. Mm -hmm. And what these researchers did is they looked at a bunch of curated data, in fact, not specifically used by any of the companies to actually develop their autonomous vehicle software, driving software, but certainly mm -hmm. used for autonomous vehicle competitions. And the companies that actually use the data that was analyzed here include Waymo, uh, Uber, Cruise, and Lyft. Here's the crux of the paper, really two points. The first one is the most damning for me. When they went over the data, and by data, I mean this is literally what the systems are using to learn how to drive. Mm -hmm. The assumption is, right, that all this data is quote unquote, you know, it's perfectly fine. We of course know that it's not. And mm -hmm. from a variety of different contexts, here's another example where it's not only not fine, you really have to scratch your head and, and wonder, you know, what, what is the industry thinking? Because what mm -hmm. this paper does is actually a relatively simple thing that at least in my mind, that this is something that should have been done all along. So mm -hmm. let, let me actually put some numbers on it. They essentially say, or they, they, they give evidence here that many of these data sets that are used certainly for these competitions, they're rife with errors. By rife, mm -hmm. I mean over 70% of the validation scenes contain at least one missing object box. But what do I mean wow. by that? So you have a little scene, right? Mm -hmm. There are bounding boxes, some of them, and they're human curated, right? Mm -hmm. So they mm -hmm. correctly bound an entity within a particular scene. There's a car, you know, there's a person. But there are many other parts of the scene where there are clearly cars, but mm -hmm. there are no bounding boxes on them. The humans oh, simply miss them. In mm -hmm. other cases, there are overlaps and one vehicle is tagged as if it's part of another, another when mm -hmm. it's not. Some mm -hmm. are rather egregious. There's a huge truck that's right smack in the middle of the scene. And for whatever reason, the human curator simply missed it. So they have found, that's the first point of this paper, is just mm -hmm. to point out the fact that there are real serious errors in these databases. Now, then they go into the second part and they give a little bit of an overview of how people have been dealing with this, which is in a sense up until now and still to this day, I guess, it, because it's easy. Well, what do you do? You first have a data set where they're being curated by humans and then you have another group of humans that are curating the curated set. And there are lots of issues with that. You can couple that with machine learning as has been done in the past, but 
for a variety of reasons, not the least of which is kind of calibrating what a machine learning algorithm would do, which is essentially take an input scene and then give you some number that presumably is going to be calibrated. And the issue is that it's not always done in a proper way. Mm -hmm. so the higher ranking elements are, well, there's, there's a possible error there. Well, it may or may not be an error. So the second part of this paper has to do with, and I found this also interesting, to leverage the fact that we have a whole bunch of data, namely the data that we are you know, literally looking at and finding all these, these issues with. But we have large amounts of data that we do know ground truth labels for. Perhaps we can mm -hmm. leverage that kind of having, having a subsidiary or an associated machine learning system that will parse these real data sets that are being used to train the autonomous driving systems, maybe we can leverage that in a way to help identify these rather egregious errors. Mm. They introduce a framework that gives a notional sense of both like a syntax and a semantics for mm -hmm. human observers going into the training sets and saying, like tagging different pieces, understanding that there's a process going on. As a simple example, let's say there are a couple of shots of some street scene that a system is supposed to learn from. Mm -hmm. And there's a, maybe a person riding a motorcycle driving through the scene. Well, that individual may be occluded for a couple of those snapshots. Maybe there's a truck passing in between for whatever reason. And maybe the human mm -hmm. curator simply missed the fact that there's a motorcycle there. Mm -hmm. Well, this system leveraging all of the other data that we have, it can begin predicting, is it reasonable to assume there's something there? Is it reasonable to mm -hmm. assume that something is moving at 300 miles an hour as opposed to 30 miles an hour? Again, in mm -hmm. and of itself, it's not surprising. If anything, it's surprising that people haven't been applying this more frequently. Yeah. And that's kind of the gist I get from, from this paper that, you know, there are ways of dealing with this. It's kind of interesting that there's an embedded machine learning within the data that's used to train machine learning. Mm -hmm. But the problem itself from the get-go, the fact that these data sets are so rife with <laughs> truly like basic basic problems with the data, that's that's rather scary. Well, very worrisome when you think about someone just kind of pointing out these sorts of issues, which I think you and I would consider kind of fundamental issues. <laughs> yeah. So wow. interesting reading, a little scary, but interesting reading. Mm -hmm. And that'll do it for this week. Although stay tuned for the next segment because we have a really fun interview. That's right. We'll be back after a short break with a discussion with professors Josh Bongard and Mike Levin for our continuing discussion on their research into Xenobots. Hi, listeners. I'm Nalanthi Samaranayaka, the director of CNA's Strategy and Policy Analysis Program. We study issues ranging from maritime strategy to managing alliances and nuclear policy. We've expanded our work in the past few years to include Arctic strategy and policy analysis and the study of non-traditional security issues, such as women peace and security, climate change and strategic partnerships, and ocean security. If you're interested in learning more about our work, please check out our webpage, cna.org strategy. Well, Andy, during the last podcast, we spoke with Doug Blackiston on the latest Xenobots research. This time, we have the principal researchers to talk with us more about Xenobots. We have with us today Josh Bongart, who is with the Department of Computer Science at the University of Vermont. We first spoke to Josh nearly two years ago on podcast 3.17. Welcome back, Josh. Hi, Dave. Thanks for having me back. All right. It's great to have you here. And we also have Mike Levin, who is with the Allen Discovery Center at Tufts University and associate faculty at the Wies Institute at Harvard. Welcome to the podcast, Mike. Thanks for being here. Thanks so much. Happy to be here. All right. So last week in our discussion with Doug Blackison, we had sort of a petri dish level discussion about the latest Xenobots research. For our discussion with you guys, we thought it would be good to first take a step back and discuss the bigger picture of the ongoing research. You both seem to be working kind of in a similar topic, but for sort of from different directions. So Josh, why don't you start us off with uh, what your research is about? So I, as you mentioned, I'm in the Department of Computer Science, um, but my primary focus is on uh, robotics and a particular approach to robotics known as evolutionary robotics. And at the 10,000 foot view, what we do is create an evolutionary simulation inside a supercomputer and then have the supercomputer try and evolve us simulated robots that we then try and turn into reality in some way. 
We've been doing this with rigid and soft robots for a number of years, and now most recently with Mike and his team, turning those virtual robots into physical biobots. That's great. So Mike, now where, where do you kind of fit in this picture and where does your research focus on? Yeah, my official designation is in the uh, Department of Biology, but I kind of see myself and my group working at somewhere in between cognitive science and computer science in biological media. So we are very interested in how living things process information, how they make decisions at all scales. So we study everything from cells to tissues to organs to whole organism behavior to try to understand how uh, minds of various kinds come about and how, how they can be embodied in, in different kinds of uh, weird manifestations. Now, I, I got to pass this now over to Andy because he's the one that clearly saw the really the wow factor in the research that you guys are doing. And, you know, I think is familiar with uh, artificial life, at least particularly from the cellular automata standpoint, really sort of keyed him into the importance of this research. So, so Andy, over to you. Yeah, the, for context, I guess for I'm going to like lob a really broad question here, but for context, my PhD is from 1988, and I kind of came up. I mean, it wasn't complex systems, but this was in the the Chris Langdon era, right, of artificial life, life as it could be. And so for me, it's really exciting to have you guys. I think you're at the forefront of really the next generation of that. And I think you even used the phrase, it, it's now in an era of machines as they could be. I was really impressed. I mean, it's probably among the more exciting things I've read, at least in a half dozen years. You guys put together a white paper, I think back in March, the title of which was Living Things Are Not Machines, where you discuss this theme of the overlap of artificial life, machine learning, synthetic bioengineering, and so on. And you kind of step through um, an enormous space of ideas of how we must reevaluate what we mean by life and evolution. So I guess, as I say, it's a very broad question. Take us back to kind of the conceptual germination of this idea that you clearly both are working from a variety of different angles, and it's something that's going to keep you and the rest of the research community active for the next 10, 20, 30 years. So forgive me for the broadness of the question, but kind of outline your vision, as it were, of Yes, all the myriad detailed things you're working on at the moment, but more importantly, kind of what, what is your vision for where this entire not quite defined field, what is it and where it's going? From my perspective, I think what's really important is that a lot of the terminology that we've been using, things like machine, um, robot, living organism, the, these kind of terms that in the past have seen seemed like good binary terms, you know, they're crisp categories that exist and you can sort of tell which class things are in. I think that none of those things are going to survive the next few decades because what is now very clear with bioengineering technologies, with chimeric technologies, and, and even without that, if you just think about the evolutionary process, and in fact, even the developmental process where we all arise from one cell, all of these transitions are extremely smooth and gradual. And so if you think that there are fundamental distinctions and people write papers all the time saying that, you know, machines can't do this and they can't do that, but living organisms can do this and that. The, the problem is that there is no distinction there. We can make combinations to incredibly fine grained level of detail that you couldn't tell which class they belong to. There just aren't such sharp distinctions anymore. And we can make, not only can we make the hybrids of all these things, but each of us started life as subcellular components, which molecular biologists rightly refer to as machines. And then we made a journey across this Cartesian cut to become um, organisms that certainly have cognition, memory preferences, a first or first person perspective, all of these things. We've all made that transition from what people call just physics to what I think uncontroversially should be called organisms with with mentality. And so we all make that journey and 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 there's no single sort of bright line where, aha, now the magic starts. No, it's 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 very gradual. So to me, the future of this field is really doing away with terminology that arose basically due to technological limitations, just things we didn't know how to do before, and really ask ourselves, what is essential about being a robot or an organism or a machine? You know, which of these terms have actual useful uh, value going forward when, when you really can't tell what something is based on what it looks like or how it got here, meaning to design versus evolved. Mm -hmm. And I think you asked about sort of what's interesting from the Xenobots point of view. I think as, as Mike mentioned, these, these Xenobots and whatever comes next 
you know, they may be useful tools as machines. They may do useful work on behalf uh, of human beings, but they're also extremely powerful weapons for demolishing dichotomous thinking. You know, humans, you know, from time to time, we get lazy with our thinking. It's really easy to divide the universe into black and white, good and evil, body and brain, genotype and phenotype. In the case of computers, it's the machine and the in internal tape. It's just easy for us to get started. But of course, you know, reality is not that simplistic. And it gets really, really hard to push into these more non-intuitive spaces and I think the Xenobots are going to be a good guide in taking us into that space where there are no clear distinctions anymore. And we need to more directly confront the complexity that's out there in the world and that we're incorporating into our increasingly complex machines. For me, that, that's certainly kind of at the core of what I find really fascinating about the work both you guys are doing in your research groups. Week after week, we have papers of, you know, here's another machine learning algorithm that improves, uh, you know, the accuracy by another 0.0% or whatever. It's very rare that you get the sense a fundamental play with things we haven't seen before. Dare I say paradigm busting, because that's basically what you guys are engaged with. Nobody's done anything like this. The technology didn't exist. People didn't have the right ideas. So that part of this research is immensely exciting, certainly for me. I'm, I'm, I'm probably not alone in that. So you compare this to you know what's going on in terms of machine learning these days. I, I think both are valid and really important. It's kind of ironic that in the field of AI, we often think about our algorithms in terms of how they balance exploitation versus exploration. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the current machine learning edifice, you know, focuses on exploitation, backpropagation of error, convolutional neural networks. They really work and they really work well. And we're trying to figure out how to make them into useful tools. And that's really, really important. But I think, you know, we are gradually learning that convolutional neural networks and deep learning in general is not the only path towards intelligent machines. It's important that we explore as well. And obviously I'm biased, but I think the Xenobots are a great tool for that exploration. Yeah, that, that's, that's a really neat point. I mean, we have so many different types of computational universes, I guess, to borrow uh, Wolfram's term. We got DNA, right? We got uh, slime moles that Andy Namatsky is doing. We got octopi and we have xenobots and, and other things. So it's, it's also partly, I guess, right, an exploration of that untapped universe of what this computation kind of coupled with life, what does that really look like? Or what are the possibilities there? Yeah, you mentioned Chris Langton a little earlier back. Mm -hmm. you know, he was sort of the pioneer of this field of artificial life in the 1980s. And as you mentioned, he's most famous for his quip that artificial life studies life as it could be rather than biology, which is limited to uh, life as it is. Mm -hmm. So until we discover aliens, you know, let's try and create the most exotic, you know, living and living slash technological constructs we can right here on Earth to really understand life as it could be, intelligence as it could be, and machines as they could be. Here's a, a question that I've been meaning to ask the researchers themselves, particularly with the kinds of things you guys are doing. Dave and I uh, pride ourselves on finding clickbaity titles in, in uh, kind of the not quite research paper journals. And with what you guys are doing, it is so easy to misinterpret and kind of leap ahead, you know, 10 or a dozen steps. And indeed, there are lots of examples, you know, uh, mad scientists uh, discover a new life that will, you know, eradicate whatever. How do you deal with what I suspect is a, a whole bunch of probes by the media to try to get these really clickbaity kind of statements that then are published perhaps out of context? Yeah, I mean, w one aspect of this is that in the end, we have a pretty limited control over what they actually end up writing. And so we try very carefully to uh, make sure that um, we convey what we think of as important here and, and the limitations and, and the right way to think about these things. But in the end, I mean, I've seen some amazing things come out online, which, gen you know, they, they, they generate an incredible amount of uh, email uh, of all stripes based on this. And I think I think it's our responsibility to uh, get the information out there as best as we can. All I know is I've learned from this process and being interviewed and seeing what comes out um, eventually in these stories is uh, I, I now can't read any news stories about anything else anymore because the delta between what I had said and what came out is such that uh, it's just impossible to, to see the news anymore. Personally, I don't worry about it too much. Um, one of the things that I've noticed in all the, the public response to Xenobots and the things that we do is, generally speaking, older folks say, my God, this is the most frightening thing I've ever heard about. 
and the younger folks say, how do I become a xenobiologist? Mm -hmm. You know, of course, it's it's overblown. There's a lot of hype. But my focus is really on, you know, the inspirational side of, of xenobots and biobots and, you know, the future of biology and AI intermingled. And you can just see how the younger generation, you know, realizes we got some significant problems on this planet to solve. And they just want to be told, you know, where to start and then for us to get out of the way. And so in all my interactions with the media, that, I mean, that's kind of who I'm trying to, to speak to and to inspire. Yeah, that sort of reminds me of a quote from Douglas Adams about describing rea people's reactions to technologies. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but anything that was in the world that you're born uh, is normal and ordinary, and that's just the natural part of the way the world works. Anything that's invented when you're between basically 15 and 35 is new and exciting, and you might be able to get a career in it. But anything invented after you're 35 is basically against the natural order of things. So maybe that's a uh, that, right. that's pretty normal reaction. <laughs> Let, let me ask both you guys a question I asked uh, Sam, which is to bring our listeners to a moment, perhaps many years in the past now, to where both of you were sitting in front of, maybe it's a Xenobot experiment, whatever it may be, but something inside of you finally clicks and says, I am seeing something genuinely different and unexpected from anything else I've done before. There is something very profound here. Now, I, I'm presuming that there are a bunch of moments like that because of the nature of, of the work you do. But if you can, because I think that for me, certainly it's, it's just an exciting thing to, to hear from researchers. You know, we, we read all the words, they've been edited. These kinds of interviews are awesome. And part of the reason they're awesome is because at least there's a possibility of getting a little bit of a privileged seat in science as it is being made. Yes, you're right. I can think of many. I'll pick one example from when I was a postdoc in the early 2000s at Cornell University. I was working in AI, not so much robotics at that time. I was working on an AI project that involves symbolic regression. And basically what symbolic regression does is an AI program that takes as input raw data and spits out guesses about equations that describe that data. And we were working with some biochemists at that time and looking at a particular biochemical pathway. And they had raw data and we fed that into our AI. And the AI spat out some equations that we emailed to our biochem colleagues. And they said, no, 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 this is all wrong. Your AI clearly doesn't work. You guys overhyped what you can do. This is all wrong. And as a postdoc, I was obviously devastated. The next day I came in, there was another email from our biochem colleagues and they said, hold on a second. <laughs> and you can kind of guess how the rest of the story goes. So they went back and forth, back and forth. And it turns out that some of the terms in those equations that have been spat out by the AI were not only things that weren't in their models, they were not things that they had thought of. And when they first saw the AI generated version, they were convinced it's absolutely wrong. So it comes back to Dave's comment about Douglas Adams. There's no way this is real. It's, you know, <laughs> right. And, and I, that's one that's always stuck out in my mind is that, you know, AI is, is, stupid and fearless in equal measures. It will drive into unknown, you know, scary, non-intuitive spaces where humans may fear to tread. And that's one of the things I love about the kinds of science that Mike and I do. The time that I'm thinking of was uh, a few years back, uh, around 2015, when um, the, and this was actually the work of an undergraduate student in the lab, and we were, as, as we still do, we're working with these flatworms, these planaria, and the, one of the amazing things about planaria is you cut them into pieces, and every piece sort of knows exactly what a correct planarian looks like, and they regenerate, right? So they rebuild everything that's missing. And so what she had done was she had chopped the heads off of these planaria with, with a very characteristic triangular head shape. And she then treated them with this, with this drug that basically for about 48 hours prevents the cells from electrically communicating with each other, right? And so, so it gives them this, this suppression of their normal ability to get together and kind of decide what they're going to do. And so she came back and she said, well, there's some kind of weird defects in the way these heads are forming. And we looked at these heads and we realized that what they were making were heads that belonged to other species of planaria. We had round ones, we had flat ones with no genetic change. So the genome was unchanged, but they were making these, these heads that belong to animals that are 150, 100 million years distant. And what occurred to me right then, it was kind of like, like this lightning bolt that I said, my God, what the genome is doing is producing a piece of hardware that is not completely hardwired as to what it's going to build. 
and it's using these electrical circuits, much like we do in, in neuroscience and in, in computer technology, it's using these electrical circuits to drive them around through morphous space, the space of all possible sort of anatomical configurations, the way that you would use circuits like this to drive a physical robot around three-dimensional space. And immediately it, it, it kind of just opened up this whole possibility of thinking about what does that morphous space look like and what else is possible that, that basically evolution is not producing solutions to specific problems. It produces problem solving machines that are able to write the hardware is only a part of the story. The next step is, well, what is it going to do in a particular environment? How is it going to solve that problem? And how weird can we really make this in the sense that if we can get standard yeah. planarian to build planarian heads from other species, what else are they willing to build? That nothing to do with their default, you know, sort of sort of obvious outcome, right? Their their default behavior. Which, which brings us, I guess, to to the most recent research that I'm aware of, right? I, I don't know, Josh, were you involved with that? But Mike, you're listed as the one of the last authors on the regrowing of limbs and frogs, which is essentially that, if I remember, right? You you give some drug cocktail, but there's nothing like specific about it. Um, maybe you can talk about that a little because <laughs> that's that's rather exciting. Sure, sure. Yeah, that's correct. Um, yep, that's a that's a project that was done in my lab in close collaboration with uh, David Kaplan. And all of these things uh, are uh, the, one of the practical implications of understanding how collections of cells make decisions about what they're going to make. One of the practical applications of that is in regenerative medicine. And so our idea was to try to assume that we're not going to be able to micromanage the construction of complex organs if they're lost or damaged or whatever. But what we could do is take advantage of the software and modularity that's in the system and uh, basically ask it to rebuild uh, structures that it already knows how to build. And so in this frog system, what we had was a bioreactor that is built by David. And it's this, um, uh, it's this kind of wearable cap with, with silk that bears the drugs. And the bioreactor was on that leg amputation wound of this adult frog. Now, frogs normally do not regenerate. So you put this thing on. It's on there for 24 hours. That's it. Then we take it off. And the idea specifically was to find a trigger. It's almost a subroutine call that says build whatever normally goes here. So 24 four hours later, we take the thing off and we never touch the, the frog again. We let it do its normal thing. And what we observed was about a year and a half of growth. So the leg begins to grow. Mm -hmm. We saw remarkable outcomes that include the ability to, for the frogs to stand on those legs. They were touch sensitive. They had all kinds of structures. They were starting to make toes. And this is, this is um, a kind of a, a very different strategy for regenerative medicine than what's normally happening where people try to, they, they think of genomic editing or stem cell biology, where you're really going to bottom up sort of micromanage this process. And I think much more interesting and, and much more feasible in our lifetime is going to be to try to exploit what the system already knows how to do. Well, I hate to say it, but we're almost out of time, sadly, which clearly to me says that we need to find another time to <laughs> chat. But any, any final thoughts to share as we wrap up here? The only thing that I wanted to point out, which I think is very interesting, is the application of some of these ideas towards understanding evolution. And when uh, when we build these xenobots, it's really important to understand that this is a collaborative process. We the, the cells do a lot of the heavy lifting. So we do a little bit in terms of liberating them from their instructive interactions within the embryo and the AI that Josh uh, and Sam make tell us how to sculpt them. But we are not micromanaging the creation of these bots. We, this is guided self-assembly. The best we can do is give stimuli and boundary conditions to these cells, and then they do all the rest. So we're working, it, it, this is very interesting kind of engineering that is, you're not working with passive parts. You're working with a kind of agential matter. You're working with these materials that have their own agendas and are going to do various things. And we just try to sort of deviate them towards specific outcomes. And it's important to keep in mind that, that that's exactly what evolution does. So evolution is, is not able to control every aspect of, of what an organism is going to be. It has to function in the context of building with cells that are themselves organisms. Every, you know, cells used to be independent organisms that have, they have their own agendas about what they can and can't and are willing to do. And this is what provides the incredible plasticity and robustness of life. And now we're, we're finally starting to build things in the way that evolution did them. There's an old slogan in AI, which is that the invention of AI is going to be the last invention that humans ever make. And that's, that's often sort of meant to, you know, suggest we're going to create a killer AI and, and HAL or, or Skynet. I, I think it's important to remember that the xenobots and the AI and all of the synthetic biology and AI technology taken together, it's hopefully going to produce useful machines, things that are helpful to human beings. But 
the bigger impact, I think, of all of this is that it's providing us with new scientific tools. As Mike just mentioned, it provides us new avenues into understanding the nature you know, of intelligence, of ourselves. So I think for, for again, some of the younger listeners, that's going to be some of the most exciting impact of AI in the years to come, is really probing into this understanding of who we are and where we came from. Very well said. Thanks again so much, both of you, for joining us. We really appreciate it. It's always Absolutely. thrilling to hear about your research. And I can say for both Andy and myself, we are eagerly looking forward to what you discover next. Thanks so much for having us on. Yeah, thanks very much. It was great. Thank you. All right. Well, if you're listening to us on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, don't forget to check out our website where we will post all the links that we discussed today, including all of that super cool Xenobots research. That's cna.org forward slash C-A-A-I. But I, for one, welcome our new computer overlords. Thanks as always, Andy. I'll see you next week. Sounds good. Sounds good.